So my name's Jason Aldred. I'm my associate Kyle Greenwell here with me. I'm a certified financial planner. And um, we're going to go over basically young physicians, residents, talking through financial planning in general. We have a lot to cover in about 30 minutes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through it to the best of my ability at a speed that is comprehensible. And then we'll, we'll try to go from there. Before I start, though, any questions that you want me to address while we're going through this about maybe student debt or talk through anything of that nature? Maybe saving for retirement, disability insurance, life insurance. I'm going to talk about all these things with specific questions before we get started. Okay. So we have partnered up with the Tennessee Medical Association, and through that organization, we have basically become their planning partner. So we do financial planning with physicians and residents. So how many are residents in here? Okay. And medical students? Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. There you go. I'm not going to forget you. So session goals. What should we be thinking about at this stage in our career? Understanding the financial issues pertinent to a resident or young physician. Prioritizing your financial goals and creating an action plan. Most important is prioritizing and forming that action plan. I think what we see the most with residents and young physicians is basically what happens is you get, you get through med school and you go into residency and it's full steam ahead. You know, you work maybe 20 hours per week, right? No. So they're working you very hard to become specialized in what you're trying to accomplish. And so the action plan is what we, we help with and kind of prioritizing and help you to stay on track. And most of that starts with the protection piece, and we'll go through kind of how we progress through that, that pyramid of action. So the financial pyramid would start just like a house would. You would put a foundation first to make sure you're on stable ground. That's going to hold up for your future. And that's going to include your life insurance, disability insurance, all the insurance, and one thing that's mentioned there also is your emergency reserve, which would be one of the most important aspects that you would need to have. That would be a cash buildup. What if something happens and I don't have the money to basically sustain a few months? Maybe my car goes out or something happens at my house that I own or something to that extent. So as you move up this pyramid, you're going to go through the protection piece and then move towards your investments move towards going all the way up to the top, which would be the simplistic wills, estate planning. And as you advance through your career, estate planning will become much more advanced where you'll need a, a much more in-depth look at that. And so we'll talk a little bit about that near the end of the presentation. So tips for better money management. We look at pay yourself first. I mean, this economy that we live in and it's going to continue to get this way is very hard to focus on paying yourself first because of all the distractions. Who has Netflix in here? Okay. Who has Amazon Prime on top of Netflix? Okay. So a lot of the same hands, right? We got to have Netflix. We got to have Amazon Prime. We got to have Sirius, you know, radio. We got to have HBO, Cinema. So we get all these different things, and they just keep on coming, and we're paying all these subscriptions for it. We need to be taking money and putting it towards our future first, and then using discretionary income which would be income left over after income versus expenses. So the next would be creating a sticking to a spending plan. So if you're going to connect with your spending plan and, and really create one for yourself, how does that look for you? For example, are you sticking to an exact budget or are you going through and just calculating what am I bringing in versus what is going out? And I would say most people look at what's coming in versus what's going out, which is not a bad thing. It's just we got to make sure that inflow versus outflow is in sync so you're not in depth at the end of each month. And then, therefore, for a lot of you, accumulating more student debt. Also, taking advantage of the compounding. I'll give you a great example of compounding interest in just a few minutes. And it's not what you earn, it's what you keep. That's, gonna, that's real important now. It's going to be real important in your future. You can make a whole lot of money in your future as a physician, but at the same time, it's going to be real hard if you don't know the tax laws and things to avoid paying so much in taxes versus how much you can actually save. And so our team, along with CPAs and so forth, work with individuals to make sure when we're building out financial plans that we're focusing not on just diversifying your assets, but diversifying your taxes. 
for the future. So when we said pay yourself first, usually with a normal individual that does not have student debt, we will focus on the first three up there, which would be the short, middle, and long-term buckets. These buckets would be for cash in your short term. That's your emergency bucket, what I said was so important for you to have earlier. Then you have your midterm bucket, which is your five to 15 year bucket. We can be moderate to aggressive inside that bucket because that's really for what if I want to buy a beach house in the future or what if I want a new car? What are my goals I'm trying to buy with these things? Okay. And then you go to your long term. Your long term is going to be your retirement plans that are offered through your groups, IRAs, traditional versus Roth, and some of the things we'll talk about in a few minutes. But those are saving vehicles for the long run. That's more of your 60, 65 um, situation there. So, and then debt reduction. So if we're talking through debt reduction, how many here have student debt? Okay. So one of the biggest challenges for you currently is what the Fed is charging for you to take out student debt. You know, I can go get a house right now and pay about 4% for a 30-year mortgage. But if I take out student debt, we're typically looking anywhere from 6 to 7.8%. Would I be accurate there? Which is really high. So if you give me money and you say, hey, Jason, take this money and let's try to make some money with it, I'm going to be hard-pressed to guarantee any type of outperformance of 6.5 to 7.8 over a short period of time. And therefore, a lot of times we focus on short-term and your debt reduction, making sure that we're paying down that debt over a long period of time, but maybe that's five to ten years, so it just depends what your definition of long is when you get out of residency. Typically, I shoot for a five-year period having that paid off, which means that your lifestyle, once you get out, doesn't change a whole lot, but just enough to where you, you feel that accomplishment as you move forward. Now, I know that's really hard for a lot of you to see, like, wow, I got a lot of student debt. There's no way I'm going to pay this off in five years. But I'm telling you, it's possible and we do it. So um, we can help to kind of show you that. So creating a spending plan, identifying your goals and writing them down, estimate your income, which you should know um, once you get into residency at least, Understand your liabilities and expenses. Liabilities are just the debts that you owe. Credit cards, student loans, house, mortgage, things of that nature. Then you take your income minus your expenses. And of course, that's what we were talking about, discretionary income. Yeah, that's pretty simple, right? It's inflows versus outflows. But then we review how this decision impacts the result. Um, whenever you see like advertisements come through TV, and they, um, I think ING is a good one where they say, what's your number? And I have that picture up there. I don't know if you all remember that one. But basically it's saying, what does your decisions every day, how does that impact your overall retirement? I can show someone in retirement spending $85,000 versus $90,000 per year, and it could affect their retirement by making them run out of money 10 years earlier just by a $5,000 swing. So money is, money is a funny thing when it talks about your everyday decisions, what you're purchasing and what you're not, and how that's going to help you in the future. So we can send all this out to you, and we'll give you um, a sign-up sheet. Kyle, has the sign-up sheet been passed around? Okay, so the, the sign-up sheet is real important that you put your email. I'm not going to blast you a ton of emails and disturb you at all hours, I, I assure you. But at the same time, what it will help me do is to send you this information, and anything that we have that's pertinent, real-time information for physicians that you should know about, we can get that information to you. It's not something that we're saying, hey, come see us every day and, and, and so forth. It's really for your benefit, and um, you know, we'll follow up thanking you and so forth, but that's real important. But we will send this to you, and what you can do is it's in a, a format to where you can put in the numbers and it automatically calculates it for you, so you can kind of play with needs versus wants. So everything that you have to have goes in the needs column, and the wants are in the other column, so you can see how that would affect you. So... An interesting example for compounding, I told you I'd come back to this. So compounding of your money. If we're compounding money, we're talking about if I put a penny in for 31 days and I double it every day for those 31 days versus giving you a million dollars today, which one would you take? Sounds like a trick question, right? Somebody spit out an answer. Would you take the million dollars or the penny? You take the penny? 
That's because you think, you think it, it's got to be the right answer, right? I told you a penny. So if you did that, it'd be $10.7 million over 31 days. And all that is is when you get to the 30th day, you're basically at $5 million, and then it doubles again and gets you over to the 10.7. So that's important because Warren Buffett, if you read any of his stuff, he's the, the mastermind, if you will, behind investing and so forth, if you know who he is, one of the richest men in the world next to Bill Gates. He talks about this and how compounding is so important. That's why you see if someone invested money in the 1950s and just left their money in this allocation and rebalanced it over time and in the, in the stock market, that compounding interest is what has helped them get to this point. So... Let's talk about what happens if you were to procrastinate. So we have an individual, the early bird versus the procrastinator. The early bird puts in $5,000 for 10 years or $50,000, and at the end is left with $224,000 after a 30-year period at only 6% interest. So we put in 50, you get 224,000 out. The next individual skips the first 10 years, invests double the amount of money over a 20-year period. So over the same 30-year period, He's put twice as much in and still has less than the other individual. And that's real important because that's, that's why you always hear people saying, start early, start early, even if it's something. You know, just start early to start doing this because over time, it starts to build up. And if you can do it, do it automatically. That's why 401Ks are so good for individuals and 403Bs and all these retirement plans that they give you at work because they automatically take it out of your paycheck, much like rent and a mortgage. You know you have to pay it. If you put that aside, you know mentally it's coming out, you start to adapt and not miss it. So protecting your credit. This is going to become real important for you as physicians because you're going to have a target on your back because of the amount of money that you typically will be making. Whether you're a surgeon, family practitioner, ENT, doesn't matter. All of these have to do with protecting your credit because of the fact that you can become a, a target for fraud, basically. Um, and what the ways we can kind of check ourselves is open mail. Make sure that you don't get anything that has your name on it. You're like, what is this? You know, I never purchased this. That's one way. One of the better ways, though, is to check one of the credit score companies at least once per year because it's free and it doesn't hurt your credit. And you can check this. I'll give you an example. I got out of college... Um, moved to um, Florida and started working for a, a company and started going through to help to streamline this process, yada, yada. But when I left, I'd seen a doctor one time, $25 bill. And two years later, I hadn't checked my credit, and I checked it, and they had it on there as unpaid, which was affecting my credit score for $25. So you could imagine I was pretty upset about that. I mean, all I had to do was pay $25 and it wouldn't have been there, been there. But you get to moving fast, and you might forget about a bill or forget about something that can go on there, and you can correct it in your credit score. They can waive that and get it, get it fixed, basically, um, through a process. So very important. Debt. Everyone has a different situation in philosophy. I mean, everybody in this room has a different situation as far as how much student debt they have. Do you own a house? Are you renting? And so forth. So this is real important to pay attention to on an individual basis. Also, paying off debt without sacrificing savings. So very, very important that you're making sure that you're saving at the same time while paying off. If you take everything that you have in your bank account every month and you put it towards debt, that's a good thing until an emergency comes up. And then you don't have any money and you're going to have to either borrow or lean on somebody else for that money. So just make sure that you're at least building up that reserve account. Um, a lot of the employers that you're going to be working for are going to have matching contributions. Let's say in your employer account, they say, well, if you put in three, we'll match three. Well, that's a free 3%. So we at, le at least need to be putting 3% in. Does that, make, does that help? Okay. Um, let me finish up on this. Know what you owe and the interest rates. And how do I consolidate my loans? So consolidation, is, have you all heard of SoFi? Okay, so SoFi is one of the largest um, consolidation companies out there, and, and they're becoming more and more prevalent where um, the banks, in my opinion, are waking up and saying, hey, we have income earners such as yourself that have been training for a long time. You're probably not just going to become a, a doctor and then turn around and walk away from it, right? So they know that you're probably going to end up paying them back. 
So what they're doing is, a lot of these companies are saying, I tell you what, take your Fed loans, move them over here, and we'll give you 4% versus your 7.8 to 6.5. The, the thing you need to be cognizant of about, though, you're going into a fixed situation, and if any of you are on pay-as-you-earn or income-based repayment, you need to have that discussion first. But there are ways to lower interest rates if you're not going to work for a nonprofit, for example, and use that pay-as-you-earn. Is everybody here familiar with pay-as-you-earn, or have you looked into that? Yeah. So pretty soon, they're going to educate you on that, and you will become very educated on it and how to, you know, the forms you need to fill out, I'm assuming, and so forth on that. But the bottom line is all these things intertwine with each other or intertwine with each other, and it's going to be very important for you to know. So just keep that in the back of your mind. There are private institutions out there that do this, but when you lock it in, you're locking it in. So if you say I'm paying off in 10 years, it's just like a mortgage. It has to be, all, it has to be paid off in 10 versus a 30-year Fed loan, for example. All right, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time here. What is disability insurance? So disability insurance, you will probably get hounded as physicians on disability insurance, and it is very important that you get it right when you're doing disability insurance because as a physician, you're going to need protection for whatever specialty you're in. So you need something called own occupation or your occupation. That basically means it's disability insurance that covers you as a physician for exactly what you do. So I'll give you an example. You have a, an individual who's a cardiologist, and they are going down the road, and all of a sudden they get hit from the side by a car, unexpectedly going through a traffic light. Someone ran a red light, hits them in a car, and breaks their back. Okay? At this point... Maybe they're in a wheelchair, maybe they are not in a wheelchair, but they have extreme pain, so they're on all kinds of medications, but their income potential is still there, but they can only work 50% of the time because they're in rehab for the next two years trying to get over this situation. Even in that case, you don't want the insurance company saying, you know what, you, you can't be a cardiologist, but I mean, you do have a lot of training, maybe you can do this over here. Or to give you a different example, you want disability insurance that's going to pay you a lot of money for what you were doing, but maybe you can't do that as a cardiologist anymore. You're going to have to go over here and teach. But since you have your occupation, it's going to allow you to get disability payments for what you were disabled for while also being able to teach. I think what's mostly overlooked is residents. Residents are paid typically fifty to $60,000 from my experience, and, and it's a very hard for you to take in the account that you might be paying for something like disability, especially at a young age, because you're like, this isn't going to happen to me. But the realization is, is the disability insurance that you would have, especially the, the insurance that the guardian, so I'm assuming everybody here has the guardian, is that correct? The residents do, okay. So the residents, for example, let's just take in the residents, and I'm going to give this specific example. If you were to become disabled today, and it paid the maximum $3,000 per month, you would be making around $24,000, excuse me, $28,000 per year, or $2,400 to be specific, after tax today. So the question you would ask yourself is, as a resident, if you have all these student debts that the Fed, that the, they're not going to forgive it, bankruptcy doesn't forgive it anymore, and you become disabled as a resident, what is your line of action at that point? And I think protecting your income and protecting against a disability is very, very, very important. Because if I were to ask you right now, what is your greatest income source that you have, the answer would be you. It's not your house. It's not your investments. It's you. So when you get to the point where you're looking at disability, make sure that you're looking for the things that really help you. There's, there's ways that they actually have now. That if you become disabled, it'll pay off your student debt. Or if you become disabled, it will help you to pay for everything that you need while you're actually going to teach or do something else, and it pays you both ways. So why buy it now? Protect yourself now while also protecting post-residency, very important. And um, I have a lot of experience kind of talking with my brother. He's an OBGYN, so he's actually a resident in Mississippi right now. And it's just interesting watching him because he has three children and he's in residency and it's, um, the budget, as you can imagine, is tight. 
So, um, but, but, you know, it's like either you pay for this or I'm going to pay for it for you type thing because it's important. Um, Hospital-provided group coverage is typically not adequate. I'll explain that in just a second. Potential discounts available. So there's a lot of discounts that can come into to play when you're talking about disability, especially as a resident. If you take advantage of it now, it's very good for you to get these discounts and be able to take advantage. Individual versus group coverage, you own it. So group coverage, they can increase rates. They can actually decide that they're not going to offer the plan anymore if they choose to. Individual plans, you own it. It's portable, you can take it with you. No premium increases on existing benefits, ability to increase coverage in the future. And additional, it's tax free upon your claim. So if you go on claim, all that money would be tax free to you because you're paying the premiums. One thing I'll tell you before you go in after residency and, and start with either a partnership or a practice you're going into or just a hospital that you're going into, you need to get individual disability first or at least convert your guardian insurance, which you can in, in convert as a resident here, to 4000 is my understanding on that. And, and the reason I say that you, you need to do that is if you go get group insurance first, group insurance doesn't ask anything about do you have extra insurance. And they don't want to insure you more than 60% of your income. But when you go and get individual coverage, they're going to ask that question. If you already have group, they're not going to want to give you that much insurance because of the fact that they don't, they don't want to insure you above 60 70%. Go ahead. Yeah. I would inquire about this as you go into residency to make sure that we compare what you have in residency and, and make sure that we attack that on the front end. And then as you progress through residency to post-residency, I think it's very important as well. Um, you know, even if you're going as a fellowship and things like that. Yes, that's exactly the time. Yes, you bet. Um, and so... Do we understand kind of where I'm going with that disability? We all understand the importance. I don't want to beat that to death. So um, life insurance, term versus permanent. So I'm sure some of you have been approached about term insurance or maybe whole life insurance and kind of wonder what the differences are. To make it very simple, life insurance is a good blend between is typically what you need. But let me explain each of them. Term insurance, you basically, let's say you want to, a million dollars, two million dollars in coverage, okay? You say, I want that for 20 years, and then it's going away. Well, if you're, if you're 30 years old, that's going to get you 20 years worth of coverage, and then it's gone. Permanent insurance, on the other hand, is something that you pay for. You're, you can pay for it until it pays itself up or for a lifetime, and it builds up a cash value, but it's a lot more expensive. So I'll give you an example, a personal example. My wife is a CRNA um, back in Nashville, and she basically, we were looking at how much insurance do we need. So we said, well, how much is a million dollars in 30-year term? It's a 30-year policy. After 30 years, it's gone, but it's only $600 for that coverage. Then, then we, say again? Per year. Per year. And then we go and look at the whole life. The whole life was about $6,000 for the same million dollars in coverage. Right? Well, that's great. It builds cash value. It does all these things. But if I bought the term, I have an extra $5,400 that I can utilize to invest or to pay down student debt and to do things with. Two, two other things that, really, um, that we see a lot. If you, if you have a family, if you're trying to protect a lot of things, and you're having to spend $6,000 for a million or $600 for a million, I'd rather you spend $1,000, $2,000 per year and have two to $3 million in term insurance to be able to protect your family versus buying a smaller whole life policy that's going to cost a lot of money. Um, so just, it's, you know, typically what I'm, what I'm talking about is blending this together. So you need to figure out, should you have enough life insurance to ensure your family can meet their obligations? So if you pass away, how is your family going to continue like they are? And how much would that cost for that to happen? And then also, many people find that their objectives are met with a blend of term life insurance and permanent. Maybe you need a million dollar term and then a smaller whole life policy and kind of blend that. That way, after 20 years, maybe you've saved enough money and you've invested enough and now you have this other policy that's just there should you ever need it 
or for burial purpose if you're thinking long term. So typical retirement options. Tell me if anybody in here recognizes the 401k, 403b. Okay? Hands? Okay, so most of us. Okay, so 401k plan, 403b, that's for-profit and non-for-profit. 403b would just be the same type of account but for a non-for-profit. So all these are is when you go and work for an employer, they typically are going to offer a plan that where you can go in and invest money. And if it's a traditional 401k or 403b, when you're putting that money in, it's as if you're not getting paid that money, which is good for the, for the extent that, let's say that you put $18,000 in that year, it looks like you made $18,000 less when you have to go pay taxes. So you, know, you don't pay taxes till the future. And that's important. So if you're not paying taxes now, you're going to have to pay taxes in the future when you take it out. And that's when we switch to a combination of that with the Roth IRA or the Roth 401k, as a lot of places have today, which means that basically you can say, I'm going to pay taxes now so I don't have to pay taxes in the future. And I personally think that it's very important that you start to diversify your investments between a traditional... 401k and the Roth and doing these things, diversify your taxes just like you've heard diversify your assets. We don't know what tax brackets are going to be 20, 30, 40 years from now. We don't know that. But I tell you what I do know is if you have multiple buckets you can choose from, you can dictate how much taxes you're paying in a given year. And that's extremely important. And there's a lot of different things on how much tax you're going to have to pay in Social Security and Medicare and all kinds of things that come into play with this. So what I really want you to understand today is 401k plan, 403b, in traditional IRA, you're going to pay taxes in the future. Roth, pay taxes now. So when we look at this, you have tax deferred. This is your long-term bucket. Okay? You have the Roth, which is tax-free in the future, and that's important because if I put money in there today, it's like the penny example. It's the compounding of that over time that you get tax-free because it's the principal you put in or the base you put in has already been taxed. And then the brokerage account. A brokerage account is simply, you, if you have a joint checking account or a joint savings account, it's just like that. Instead of holding cash, you're holding investments. You open a joint account or an individual account, and you say, I want to invest in stocks. I want to buy Google or Apple or any of these other things. And that's kind of how a brokerage account is. The beauty of a brokerage account is that you can get to it before 59 and a half. And that's when most of your retirement plans are going to be locked up until 59 and a half without that 10% penalty, with some exceptions on the Roth IRA. So these are checking, brokerage, real estate, and then you have your tax free investments in the middle, and then some of the other things simple, SEP, traditional. You'll be introduced to these more as you get closer to um, post residency and how you can implement some of these to save a lot more in taxes. So last part here, estate planning. So I'm going to touch on a couple things here that I, I think are real important, starting with the last will and testament. How many in here think that they need an estate plan? Give me a raise of hands. Okay. Well, that would be correct, because everybody in here needs an estate plan, and let me tell you why. If you were to pass away right now and your material objects that you have, whether that be a house, car, jewelry, all of these things, if you don't have anything telling where that goes and you pass away, the judge is going to sit up there and look at all of your assets and then make a decision for you. Okay? So if nobody knows where your assets go, there's no piece of paper telling us that. We need that. And that's what that does, last will and testament. A durable power of attorney Typically, when attorneys draw this up for you, they're also going to put that in there. It basically says if you become incapacitated or if you can't make cognitive decisions, then they're going to help you to understand how to do that by utilizing a friend or a family member that you're going to make a power of attorney. And if you don't want to give them full discretion right now, you can put some clauses in there that basically says I have to be mentally incapacitated or I can't make my own decisions before this kicks in, which is important. And if something happens to you today, you leave the parking lot and get hit by a car, and you can't make decisions, who's going to handle your affairs? That's very hard, especially um, with new things that they have to allow them to you know, go into different accounts that are online. That's a whole new thing because it's a, a new system. Facebook, for example, when someone passes away, 
it's very hard to get their Facebook off because nobody can get in there. And some of these documents will allow that to happen, allow those things to stop. Um, living will and health care uh, care proxy, I'm sure that some of you are familiar with this. This is basically what if I am incapacitated or on a feeding tube, something like this. What are my life end stages? What do I want to happen? So you can dictate that. State of Tennessee basically has a pre-drafted of that. Beneficiary designations. Make sure that all of your beneficiary designations are up to date. I'll give you another example. I was going through, my wife and I were married maybe a year at this point. I started going through everything on her, and she was switching up her you know, group benefits, and I'm starting to go through and help her, and all of a sudden we get the insurance, and her mother's still listed as the beneficiary. Well, that would have been awful. You know, if something happened to her, and then her mother gets all this money, and I'm just taking care of my child, that's a problem. So it can happen to the best of us, but I'm, I'm saying you've got to be cognizant of this, make sure that everything is in order. Like even your checking accounts, it needs to have a POD or a TOD attached to it. All that is, you walk into the bank and say, I want to name a beneficiary in my checking account. And if something happens to you, it would avoid probate, which is the courts, and it would go straight to your beneficiary. Simple things like that. And special needs, children. If you, if you have special needs child or if you know someone who has a special needs child, very, very important that they have their um, affairs in order because typically they can have on average about $2,000 per month to that special need child's name. And if you were to leave them something and they were to get that, all of a sudden that could take government benefits away from them. So, so these, are, these are the main uh, topics for estate planning. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer those here in a few minutes on that. Um, so what to look for in an advisor. So when you're trying to find an advisor, you're doing your due diligence, um, you're trying to kind of go through, there's, there's a lot of financial advisors out there, I would recommend that you look for someone who has a CFP, which is a Chartered Financial, or excuse me, Certified Financial Planner, or a CHFC, which is a Chartered Financial Consultant. Uh, these designations are basically going to give you the realization that this individual has gone through the extra training and the extra testing, most importantly, to get to that, that side of things. Much like going to see an accountant versus a CPA. You would want to go see a CPA if you're having your taxes done. Um, so proper licensing and finding that is important. Plus, certified financial planners have a fiduciary responsibility. What that means is if you go to a financial planner and you ask them about what they're going to recommend for you, they have to make it in your best interest. If you go to an investment advisor that does not have a fiduciary responsibility as it sits today, there is nothing saying, you know, written out that they have to act in your best interest, even though they should be. Okay? So what do we do now? So we can schedule one-on-one -on -one consultations to kind of help you to understand where your situation is, uh, go through these things we've talked about, and kind of help give you a game plan for the future. We can also review your current financial plan and create an action plan with you and show how we go about doing that. That is a complimentary um, consultation that we have with you. Again, uh, with the Tennessee Medical Association, we've, we've made that agreement um, with them that we're basically going to go through this and help you with this um, without you know, going through the charges of that unless we're building out a comprehensive financial plan. And if you're wanting to build a comprehensive financial plan, that's basically recommendations, action plans, and really building that out from A to Z. So failure to plan is a plan to fail. I truly believe that. I think that if you're procrastinating on this stuff. We really need to get ahead of the eight ball on that. And um, so take action. So with that, being, with that being said, I'm going to take questions for a few minutes. I'm going to turn this mic off, make sure that that's not, that's not me, um, if that's okay.